Emerald City of Oz. First and foremost, after leaving the land of the Grollywogs, General Guff had to recross the Ripple Lands, and he did not find it a pleasant thing to do. Perhaps having his whiskers pulled out one by one and being used as a pincushion for the amusement of the jailer had not improved Guff's temper. The old elf raged at the recollection of the wrongs he had suffered and vowed to take vengeance on the Grollywogs after he had used them for his purpose. He went on in his furious way until he was halfway across the Ripple Land. When he reached the Great Plains again, and the ground was firm under his feet, he began to feel better. Instead of going back home, he turned directly west. A squirrel, perched in a tree, saw him take this road and called to him wearingly, Beware! But he paid no attention. An eagle paused in its flight and looked at him wonderingly and said, Look out! But he went on. No one could say Guff was not brave. He was determined to visit the phantasms who were very dangerous creatures that lived on the very top of the mountain of Fantastico. The phantasms were so feared no one had been near their mountain home for several thousand years. Yet, General Guff hoped to convince them to join his proposed war against the good and happy Oz people. Guff knew very well that the phantasms would be almost as dangerous to the elves as they would be to the Ozites. But, He thought he was so clever he could manage these strange creatures and make them obey. There was no doubt that if he could enlist the services of the phantasms with their tremendous power, united with the strength of the Grollywogs and the cunning of the Whimsies, the Land of Oz would be doomed to absolute destruction. So, the old elf climbed the foothills and trudged along the wild mountain paths until he came to a big canyon that circled the mountain of Fantastico and marked the boundary line of their dominion. The canyon was about a third of the way up the mountain, and it was filled with red-hot molten lava. The heat from this mass and the poisonous air were so unbearable that no bird flew over and all living things stayed far away. Now, Guff had heard, during his long lifetime, many tales of the dreaded phantasms. He had heard of this barrier of melted lava, and also understood there was a narrow bridge that crossed it in one place. So, he walked along the edge until he found the bridge. It was a single arch of gray stone, and lying flat on the bridge was a sleeping scarlet alligator. When Guff stumbled over the rocks approaching the bridge, the creature opened its eyes, from which tiny flames reflected back. After looking at the intruder wickedly, closed its eyelids, and again lay still. There was no room for Guff to pass the alligator on the narrow bridge, so he called out to it. Good morning, friend. I don't wish to hurry you, but please tell me if you are coming down or going up. Neither, snapped the alligator, clicking its cruel jaws together. The general hesitated. Are you planning to stay there long? he asked. A few hundred years or so, said the alligator. Guff softly rubbed the end of his nose and tried to think what to do. Do you know if the first and foremost phantasm is at home or not? Guff asked. I am sure he is. He is always at home, replied the alligator. Who is that coming down the mountain? asked the elf, gazing upward. The alligator turned to look over its shoulder and Guff ran to the bridge and jumped over the alligator's back before it could turn back. The scarlet monster snapped at the elf's foot, but missed it by a mile. Ha ha, laughed the general, who was now back on the mountain path. I fooled you. Yes, you did, and perhaps you fooled yourself, retorted the alligator. Go up the mountain, if you dare, and find out what the first and foremost will do to you. I will, declared Guff boldly. On he went up the path. The scene was wild and gradually it grew more and more awful in appearance. A full red moon was shining bright. Or maybe it was the sun. Guff could not tell. All the landscape was red, hot, and foreboding. The rocks and trees all had shapes of frightful creatures. Suddenly, a man with the head of an owl appeared before Guff. His body was hairy like an ape, and he only wore a scarlet scarf 
twisted around his waist. He had a huge club in his hand, and his round yellow eyes blinked fiercely. What are you doing here, he demanded, threatening Guff with his club. I have come to see the first and foremost, replied the general, who did not like the way this creature looked at him, but still was not afraid. Ah, you will see him, the man said, with a sneering laugh. The first and foremost will decide your fate now. He will not punish me, returned Guff, calmly. I have come here to do him and his people a rare favor. Take me directly to your master. The owl man raised his club with a threatening gesture. If you try to escape, he said. But the general interrupted him. Spare your threats, he said. Lead on and be silent. Guff thought he was clever, and it seemed a shame he was such a bad character. He might have accomplished a lot for a good cause. He realized he was in a dangerous position by coming to this dreadful mountain, but he also knew that if he showed fear, he was lost. So, he adopted a bold manner as his best defense. The wisdom of this plan was soon evident, for the phantasm with the owl's head turned and led the way up the mountain. At the very top was a level plain with many boulders and piles of rock. At first glance, they seemed solid, but Guff discovered all the rocks were dwellings and each had an opening. No one could be seen outside the rock huts. All was silent. The owl man led the way among the groups of dwellings to one standing in the center. It seemed no better and no worse than any of the others. Outside the entrance, his guide gave a low call like an owl. Suddenly, another hairy man with the head of a bear jumped out of the rock opening. He glared at the stranger in evident surprise. Why have you captured this foolish wanderer and brought him here? He demanded, addressing the owl man. I did not capture him, was the answer. He passed the scarlet alligator and came here on his own free will. The first and foremost looked at the general. Are you ready to die then, he asked. No, indeed, answered Guff. I am an elf and the general of the king's army. Elves are a long-lived race, and I expect to live a long time. Sit down, phantasms, and listen to what I have to say. With all this knowledge and bravery, General Guff did not know that the steady glare from the bare eyes was reading his thoughts as clearly as if they had been spoken. He did not know that the rocks were phantasms cleanly disguised. He also had no idea he was standing in the middle of one of the most splendid and luxurious cities ever built by magic power. All he could see was a rocky, barren wasteland with a hairy man with an owl head and another with a bear head. The phantasms were powerful sorcerers, and they allowed him to see nothing more. Suddenly, the first and foremost reached and grabbed Guff around the neck. Before the general could think what was happening to him, he was dragged inside the rock hut. Inside, his eyes were still blinded by magic, and he could only see a dim light, and the hut seemed as rough and rude inside as it was outside. He had a strange feeling that many bright eyes were watching him, and that he stood in a vast and extensive hall. The first and foremost now laughed grimly and released the prisoner. If you have anything to say that is interesting, he remarked, speak now before I strangle you. So Guff spoke out. He tried not to pay any attention to a strange rustling sound that he heard, as if an unseen multitude was drawing near to listen. He could only see the fierce bear man and addressed his speech to him. He told of his plan to conquer the land of Oz and plunder the country of its riches and enslave its people, who being fairies, could not be killed. After saying all this, he talked about the tunnel the Elf King was building. He then asked the first and foremost to join the elves to conquer the Emerald City. The general gave an impressive speech, but when he finished, the bear man began to laugh as if very amused and the laughter seemed to be echoed by a chorus of an unseen multitude. Then, for the first time, Guff began to feel worried. 
Who else has promised to help you? Finally asked the first and foremost. The Whimsies and the Grollywogs, replied the general. The first and foremost started laughing again. What do we have to gain from helping you? was the next question. Anything you like, with the exception of King Rokot's magic belt, replied Guff. At this, the phantasm set up a roar of laughter, which had its echo in the unseen chorus, and the bear man seemed so amused that he actually rolled upon the ground and shouted with merriment. Oh, these blind and foolish elves, he said. How big they seem to themselves and how small they really are. Suddenly, he arose and seized Guff's neck again, dragging him out of the hut into the open. Then, the first and foremost slowly raised his arms, and in a twinkling his hairy skin fell, and he appeared before the astonished elf as a beautiful woman. She was pale-skinned with black hair and black angel wings. She wore a flowing black gown. Fire burned all around her in the room. Her face was noble and calm. The woman now raised her arms and changed herself into a huge black butterfly. Guff had only time to cry out and take a step backward. Then, the first and foremost, who had resumed to be the beautiful black-haired woman, turned to the elf and asked, Do you still demand our assistance? More than ever, answered the general firmly. Then tell me, what can you offer the phantasms that we do not have already? inquired the first and foremost. Guff hesitated. He really did not know what to say. The Elf King's magic belt seemed a poor thing compared to the astonishing magical powers of these people. They could already have as much gold, jewels, and without any effort. He was dealing with a mighty power beyond his imagination. There was really only one argument that might influence the phantasms, who were creatures of evil. Permit me to call your attention to the exquisite joy of making the happy unhappy, he said at last. Consider the pleasure of destroying innocent and harmless people. Ah, you have answered me, cried the first and foremost. For that reason, alone we will join you. Go home and tell your weakling king that as soon as his tunnel is finished, the phantasms will be with him and lead his legions to the conquest of Oz. The deadly desert alone has kept us from destroying Oz long ago, and your underground tunnel is a clever thought. Go home and prepare. Guff was very glad to be permitted to go with this promise. The black-winged woman led him back down the mountain path and ordered the scarlet alligator to allow the elf to cross the bridge in safety. With the elf gone, a brilliant and gorgeous city appeared on the mountain top, clearly visible to the eyes of the gaily dressed multitude of the phantasms that lived there. The first and foremost, beautifully arrayed, address the others in these words. It is time we went into the world and brought sorrow and fear to its people. We have remained by ourselves on this mountaintop for too long. We will use King Rokot's tunnel to conquer the land of Oz. Then we will destroy the elves and all who support them. The multitude of evil phantasms eagerly applauded with support for this plan. Thank you.